Hello, and welcome. Thank you for joining this live stream public dialogue on YouTube and Twitter. My name is Brad Hinsey, and I am the Carl Rahner Professor of Theology at Fordham University. I'm also the director of a two-year project entitled Taking Responsibility, Jesuit Educational Institutions Confront the Causes and Legacy of Clergy Sexual Abuse. In this project, Fordham is collaborating with colleagues from Georgetown, Gonzaga, Santa Clara, and Xavier Universities, among others, and an interdisciplinary group of Fordham faculty in the exploration of gaps and frontiers in our understanding of the causes and remedies of clergy sexual abuse and Episcopal malfeasance. The release of the report on the history of sexual abuse by former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick sparked this collaboration on today's online dialogue with our colleagues at the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life at Georgetown University. This dialogue is being recorded and will be posted on our website and social channels for later viewing. Our panel includes four leaders with long and differing experience in dealing with this topic. Two are survivors of clergy sexual abuse. One who has worked for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and one who has worked closely with Pope Francis as well as a respected historian on US Catholicism and a journalist who covered McCarrick for decades. Our panelists are John Carr, who served for 25 years at the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops and is now the director of the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life at Georgetown. Juan Carlos Cruz, who is originally from Chile and a survivor of clergy sexual abuse, is an executive working in Philadelphia. Kathleen Sproz Cummings is the director of the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism and professor of American Studies and History at the University of Notre Dame. And David Gibson is a well-respected journalist who previously worked for the Religion News Service before joining the Fordham community and becoming the director of the Center on Religion and Culture. We encourage all those watching to share your thoughts on social media using the hashtag McCarrick Lessons and submit questions to the panelists by following the prompts at the bottom of the screen. My first question to our entire panel is this. What do you think is the most important thing about this report? Let's begin with John. Well, first of all, Brad, uh, thanks to you and your colleagues at Fordham for suggesting we do this. The idea is that a month after the report, we would take a step back and look at, at some, some of its implications. For me, the most important thing is that this happened. Imagine this, the, one of the oldest, most secretive institutions in the world uh, discovers, uh, it's reported that one of its senior leaders has been engaged in horrific conduct. And people say, how could this happen? How could he arrive at this place? And the Vatican, under pressure admittedly, says, uh, we'll look at that. And we will share everything we have about that and produces 450 pages of letters and reports of meetings. To be honest, I don't know if Georgetown or Fordham would do that except under subpoena. So Pope Francis deserves credit and the people who did the report deserve credit. We'll talk about its strengths and weaknesses. So the most important thing is that this happened and we can make a judgment about that. The other thing that's really important, it is only that. It is a report of what the Vatican do, did and, uh, uh, and missing from the report because of its scope is what, 
why are the voices of victims, survivors, and their families missing? Why is there no empathy? Why is there no uh, compassion? Why is there no action? So full credit for doing this. It took a long time, but uh, Pope Francis deserves credit. And it shows uh, the failures of the system. Who got listened to and who didn't? Thank you. Juan Carlos, what do you think is most important? Well, um, thanks, Brad, and thanks, Georgetown Fordham and everybody for inviting me here. Um, I'm very honored and um, to represent so many people that, uh, you know, I get these platforms to, to uh, represent so many people that sometimes cannot say a word that have to be, that are silent, that, and I'm very honored, uh, and I'm, I'm sure I don't represent everyone but 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 it's my intention to to be a voice like john of, of survivors so i agree with john i'm glad this happened uh, my first thought um, might be a bit selfish uh, given my own experience but when i read it i i said to myself no wonder nobody believed me no but no wonder nobody believed us because the the clericalism that you see here the camaraderie, bad, 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 badly understood camaraderie, and, and uh, you know, brotherhood of these bishops, it's, it's, it's appalling. It's appalling. And, um, and, and it's appalling in the sense that it wasn't one, two, three, it was so many, and in so many different geographical places, and in the Vatican, you know, when, I, I've, I've remained Catholic, I'm Catholic, very proud of it, and I always will, and they're not gonna win, they're not gonna kick me out. But, but you know, um, when I, I told my friends the first time we, we decided to be public about, about our situation, I said, no, let's go to Cardinal Erasuri's, the Cardinal in Santiago. He's a Cardinal, he is going to help us. This is too horrible for someone like him not to do something. And of course, uh, history tells us that they, he did nothing, covered up, and it was sort of the same thing as the McCarrick thing. So in a way, I give Pope Francis, not in a way, I give Pope Francis a lot of credit for doing this. Um, I think this should be the standard um, perfected uh, of every survivor, not just a few privileged ones that uh, get a report like this, uh, every survivor deserves something like this. So we'll talk more about, about it, but those are my initial uh, thoughts. Kathleen. Thank you for having me as well. It's an honor to be here. I agree that the fact that this report was commissioned and published and, and, is remar and made public is, is remarkable. The rich documentation, it's not only 450 pages, but 1,450 footnotes, uh, the no limits that were placed on archives, which is truly astonishing from the perspective of a historian, the 90 interviews. Collectively, I think what's so important, what this amounts to is that this report really helps us answer in part the question of what's Catholic about the Catholic clergy sexual abuse crisis. A sexual abuse of children occurs wherever adults have access to and power over children. So what makes this crisis different? And I think so much of that is revealed in this report. It shows the clerical and hier hierarchical culture that enabled and covered up this abuse. It shows some of the most chilling moments for me were the ways that sexual crimes and sacramentality were intertwined. The confession as a site for abuse itself or for grooming of victims. I was particularly chilled to read the quote from McCarrick when he was uh, caressing the shoulders of one of his victims. And he said, someday I will lay hands on you when I ordain you. Uh, that evocation of a, a, a sacred sacrament tied to a sexual crime. So I think this helps us answer the question that all of us who are studying this crisis have to answer. What are the uniquely Catholic layers? And, uh, and, and this report really does go a long way. Unlike previous reports, which 
some people are able to dismiss as saying, well, they don't, the person who wrote this doesn't know how the Catholic Church works. They don't understand. This is exactly how the Catholic Church works. This is an insider's report, and it has uh, revealed an awful lot. The layers of complicity are deep and very damning, and there's certainly a lot more to say about that. And David, David Gibson. Well, thanks, Brad, and thank you again for the invitation to be here. I want to echo what all my fellow panelists have said uh, very much, and especially just the fact of this report, again, uh, is a remarkable document in and of itself, uh, even with its, its limitations. A couple of things that I want to just uh, point to. One is any document like this or any story of this, we have to center the victims, the survivors. Um, and we've seen so many of these, these stories and these terrible tragedies. The thing that's different here is it really sheds light, I think, on the issue of the abuse and harassment of adults in the church. It's not just children, the, the horrible uh, abuse of children, which we're so familiar with, all too familiar with. That is something I think that, um, that uh, you know, McCarrick was so... Um, was so adept at manipulating that that situation and that's really a challenge for the church beyond protecting children it's also how do we protect adults how can re adults report their issues of abuse the second thing i think that is um particularly new about this episode and this report is uh, picking up on what kathy said is it really pulls back the curtain on the process for selecting bishops in the Catholic Church. I mean, reading this report, I'm so struck that if you ask any Catholic or almost any person how the Bishop of Rome is chosen, the Pope, they'll be able to tell you. The Pope dies or resigns. All the Cardinals come to Rome. They talk for a couple of weeks. They go into the Sistine Chapel, white smoke. They elect a guy, he comes out in white. Ask any Catholic, even well-educated Catholics, how is their own bishop chosen? Nobody has a, an idea. This report sketches, there's a, a platonic ideal of how it's done with some consultations. Nobody knows who is consulted. Nobody knows the questionnaires. Nobody knows the candidates. Nobody knows anything about the process. There is a process, but this report shows how that process is corrupted. And I think that's something that we really need to that, that points to a structural and policy reform that we can also look toward. Thank you. So let's uh, broaden the discussion here and follow up uh, with the question uh, to each individual panelist. John, you have worked closely, very closely with former Cardinal McCarrick as director of the Department of Justice, Peace and Human Development at the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops for many years. What were your reactions as you read the report and what do you view as its strengths and weaknesses? Well, uh, made my head hurt. It, it made my heart hurt. It made my stomach sick. Uh, the last 150 pages uh, were about times when I worked closely with uh, Theodore McCarrick. He, he is a good friend of mine. He, we did a lot of good together. And uh, so I have some sympathy for those who felt deceived. Uh, at one point, uh, I was contacted by a journalism a journalist who directed me to these reports and rumors. And I asked uh, Cardinal McCarrick directly, how could this be possible? What's going on here? And he looked me straight in the eye and said, None of that happened. It's my enemies. Everyone has investigated this. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the FBI even. If any of that were true, uh, I wouldn't be here. And I believed him. I wanted to believe him. So it, uh, it was tough reading. Uh, the strengths and weaknesses, we've talked a lot about the strengths. It's all here. The the corruption, the isolation, the, uh, the money, the manipulation. Uh, they, the, its strength is its clarity of focus. This is about what the Vatican knew and what it did. Its weakness is its clarity of focus. It only focuses on that. We only get a little bit about what happened before, uh, uh, what's reported in this, the abuse of young people in New York uh, 
and Newark. Uh, it lays it out clearly, uh, definitively, and then it asks us to reflect on what it means. And so I think one of its strengths is that it shows us what we ought to be working on. Uh, silence is dangerous. Clericalism is destructive. Hyperclericalism can be horrific. Power is too centralized and narrow. Leaders are often isolated, and their decisions reflect that. Uh, a big weakness, I think, is the dismissal of money as a part of McCarrick's rise. Uh, it, it acknowledges that he raised a lot of money, gave a lot of money away. I watched some of that. Uh, but it says it didn't play a decisive role in his rise. It didn't hurt. <laughs> and uh, in fact, I think one of the lessons here is we need to know uh, who's raising money, uh, from whom, for what, and how is it used. The big weakness is because of its structure, the voices of victims and survivors and the story of Mother One who bought stamps, went to the library to write letters, uh, that will haunt me uh, forever. Juan Carlos, you are well known for challenging Pope Francis during his January 2018 visit to Chile, based on your own experience as a victim survivor of clergy abuse. Your critique of this clerical abuse of a Chilean bishop's complicity and of Pope Francis's support of this bishop was instrumental in bringing about Pope Francis's change of mind and heart and the Pope's plea for forgiveness from you and your friends for his own slander of your reputations. Based on your own experience, what did you learn from this report and how did it match your experience in trying to confront sex abuse in Chile? Specifically, what attitudes, actions, and obstacles do you see in the report which hurt victims and the church? Thanks, um, Brad. Um, well, um, there's so much you could say about this. And, and um, first of all, I, um, you said it well, uh, Pope Francis had a different idea of, of what we were and what we were about and what other survivors maybe were about. And the capacity this man has to change, to admit, to recognize uh, mistakes. Um, infallible Pope, he's fallible. He makes mistakes. He said it in a letter to the world that he made a huge mistake and apologized. I mean, that's pretty big. Um, then um, I recognize in Pope Francis, and I'm not his spokesperson, I'm not his, but I, I do love him dearly. Um, and and um, I have to admit, um, he's done so much compared to what we've seen. I mean, it, there's so much to be done still, right? Um, because this this tragedy is 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 a tragedy. It's horrible, um, and there's so many people who don't have justice and need justice. So many people that have died um, early uh, by suicide or by because of things like this. So it is a horrible tragedy, um, and so. But what I've seen in Pope Francis with Vos Estis Lux Mundi, with what I've seen him do with, um, you know, abolishing the, the, the pontifical secret or um, what I've seen him do uh, for many survivors is enormous. But what I also see in, 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 in this is, um, um, and we can talk more about it later, but um, I see bishops that are absolutely corrupted by power. Um, I, I, you know, there's been consequences with McCarrick. He's no longer a cardinal. He's been, you know, um, but uh, there has to be more consequences. There has to be, why is Vigano, uh, you know, walking around the world, uh, hiding in his, um, you know, hole somewhere? 
uh, criticizing everything. Why are bishops like Strickland, like uh, uh, Gomez, like others uh, who jumped when Viganò uh, said everything about McCarrick, the report comes out, nobody utters a word now. And they were the first ones to criticize Pope Francis. And yet, uh, and that's the, the horrific thing, you know, and Chapu now, um, that's a horrific thing that you see this sort of organized crime um, uh, uh, protecting each other. Um, and uh, the, it, it's about protecting themselves and not, not protecting the vulnerable. And you said it well, David, uh, this is also about adults, about women that, that are, that it's not just kids that are abused, right? And so um, it, this opens so many other, um, you know, uh, you, you pull the curtain, you see so many other horrific things that survivors go through and, and people go through. So um, to me, there has to be consequences, not just that McCarrick is out of the way. We'll come back to that. Kathleen, since the release of the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report on clergy sexual abuse in 2018, you have been outspoken in saying that incremental church reform is not enough to address these issues, but that the interlocking hierarchies of clergy over people and men over women must be changed. As a historian of Catholicism, what do you think the McCarrick Report teaches us about the failure of the Catholic hierarchy to incorporate the role of the laity and particularly women in the decision-making processes involved in holding bishops and cardinals accountable and responsible? Brad, we've heard about the absence of, of victims' voices in the report, and I, I just want to start by saying how humbled I am to be on this panel with Juan Carlos and John, and of their bravery, really, and I say that also to the many survivors of clergy sexual abuse who are surely listening this afternoon. It's, um, I, I'm in awe of your courage. But yes, the absence of uh, lay voices in this report, and particularly a subset of the laity um, of women, um, we, I think, all agree that the clerical culture is uh, the main cause of this crisis or, or certainly a, a main cause. But I do believe that gender adds another layer to this problem. And uh, John, also my heart uh, just breaks reading about mother number one. But a, an even more telling nugget uh, in this report for me was the account uh, referring to Mother Mary Quentin Sheridan, Superior General of the Religious Sisters of Mercy of Alma, Michigan, who telephoned the Apostolic Nuncio in April 1994 to discuss allegations of bad moral conduct of Archbishop McCarrick with seminarians that she had heard in the context of a retreat she was giving to priests. Uh, she urged the Nuncio to follow up on this, um, and also suggested that John Paul II avoid Newark on his upcoming trip to the United States. The Nuncio largely dismissed uh, Mother Mary Quentin, Mother Quentin's uh, concern, attributing them to uh, possible slander, but also suggesting that Mother Quentin had perhaps acted out of a desire to make herself feel important. This episode is consistent with a long history of the church's silencing and suppressing of women, a denial of their authority, um, women's absence in this particular report and in church leadership in general certainly did not cause the sex abuse crisis, but it absolutely accentuated it. Uh, clericalism combined with the reflexive dismissal of women and in some cases outright misogyny is a particularly toxic mix and there'll be no moving forward until this is resolved somehow. Kathleen, your most recent book is on the history of saint making at the Vatican. Pope and now Saint John Paul II is at the center of the report for what he did and what he failed to do regarding McCarrick's rise in the hierarchy. What does it mean to have a canonized person who was in the middle of this? And what does it suggest for the future of the vetting process? 
Well, first of all, no one is calling into question John Paul II's sanctity. Uh, to be a saint means to be in God's eternal presence, and only God decides that. So what we're talking about here is a canonized saint. Canonization affirms um, that a person is in God's eternal presence and holds that person up for veneration and imitation. This case, the case of uh, St. John Paul II, demonstrates, and particularly uh, this report demonstrates that it's better to be a little more patient when it comes to opening causes for canonization of church leaders, especially popes and bishops. Let historians do their work, let time elapse. Ironically, it was John Paul II that changed the requirement from, it used to be a 50 year waiting period from the time of a person's death and the opening of a cause for canonization. And he himself reduced that to five years in part to provide uh, more contemporary heroes for the church. Um, and in some cases that's probably fine, but not in the cases of uh, a, a man who served in high office like this. If John Paul II hadn't already been canonized, it's highly doubtful that any cause would be opened on his behalf, given what we know now, and particularly with what we know now about his knowledge of McCarrick. Um, and I dare say what we might find out in future investigations. There's a larger question here of, of why we canonize popes in the, in the first place, as Ken Woodward has pointed out many times, uh, uh, the, the, the canonization of popes is a fairly modern phenomenon. And one of the purposes of canonization is to secure a place uh, for a holy person in the collective memory of the church. Uh, that happens anyway for popes. So is canonization superfluous? More to, I, more to our point today, um, I seriously doubt that any man who has served in high office in the Catholic church in the past 50 or 60 years will be canonized in the near future. Sex abuse is going to color everything. And, and we have a concrete example of that in this country with the cause for canonization of Bishop Fulton Sheen. Uh, he was slated to be beatified a year ago this month, and that was put on hold indefinitely because of allegations of possible cover-up when he was Bishop of Rochester. So I think that um, it, 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 what this case, there's no question of, of, of decanonizing uh, John Paul II, that's not even a thing. And uh, it's also not a question of whether he is, uh, as I said, in God's eternal presence. What it does uh, show is that there is so much we don't know about uh, the layers of complicity in sex abuse. And it makes sense to wait before we open up any other causes uh, of men who served in high office in the church. Thank you. David Gibson, you have been tracking the accusations against Theodore McCarrick longer than any of us in New Jersey, Washington, the Vatican, and in other places around the world. What did you learn from the report about how McCarrick survived and thrived in this ecclesial culture? And what do you think needs to change to avoid this in the future? Well, I think I was struck in this 450 page report that was such a, uh, as, as John uh, Carr said, hurts your head to, to get through it. 1400 or something footnotes. Um, the thing I, I was struck by, and, and I wrote a, an article about it in, in Commonweal, it was kind of my organizing principle, was that uh, when he first became a bishop back in the early 1980s, the, the founding bishop of the Metuchen Diocese in New Jersey, um, a KGB agent tried to recruit McCarrick, a KGB agent who was undercover as a UN diplomat in New York. And um, the FBI got wind of it and told McCarrick that this was a um, KGB agent, and they tried to get McCarrick to serve as a double agent. Not only that, the nuncio, the, the Vatican's representative in Washington at the time, encouraged McCarrick to follow up on this, <laughs> which is kind of stunning. It's not really the, the, the sort of career path you envision for your bishop. And, it's, um, and nothing really came of this, it turns out. But what I think it's indicative of is, is that McCarrick was identified as someone early on whose personality would allow him to operate within this hierarchical culture and operate very successfully because that hierarchical culture, as I tried to say, is so much like a kind of a culture of spy craft. And I think just to you know, expand on and maybe um, complicate a bit our, our uh, definition of clericalism, 
it's not just an old boys network where they cover for each other. What this report shows is how much they hate each other and how much, I mean, it's a brotherhood. And we all know what brothers are like <laughs> and can be like, unfortunately. But so much of what goes on, what this revealed is how much backstabbing there is and conniving and gossiping and all of this kind of jockeying for power and position. And that is so detrimental to the health of the church in, in obvious ways beyond just what McC it allowed McCarrick to do. He was able to operate, even though I think what's so, what was so uh, striking is how much he was uh, disliked by the powers that be and how much they used him. As John said, I think, you know, I, I think money was a little too much downplayed in this report. He was a remarkable fundraiser, money talks and money walks in the church. We have to address that. Um, when they wanted to send uh, someone on a troubleshooting mission someplace around the globe, let's get Ted McCarrick to do it. He was very useful, even as they tried to keep him in a box. So he was able to work within that area. I think what, what the clericalism shows is, uh, I think to pick up on something Juan Carlos said, which is almost the organized crime element. They're gonna do their best to knock each other off, but it's our thing. They treat the church, this culture treats the church as a possession, as a thing to be uh, dominated and maintained and a game to play. And there's no reference to the gospel and to the flock. And that's really what needs to change. More to be said there. Um, David, you appear in the report several times as a journalist trying to track down leads. What is it like to see your name in a print in this kind of a document? <laughs> and what does it teach you or teach us about the practice of journalism? Well, I mean, it's, you know, I, I debated whether to talk to Jeffrey Lena, the principal um, uh, in, uh, author of this report, um, and who I think did a, really a, a very good job uh, generally with it. And um, he was extremely diligent. And, you know, I'm out of daily journalism now. Um, and so I felt that liberated me a little more to talk to him about what it was like and, and what we had heard and why nobody was able to track down these rumors that we heard about McCarrick. And I think it's, you know, there are a couple of things that it, it really points up. One, is that you know, we wouldn't be here without journalism, without the media. The media broke this story, not just the Boston Globe in 2002, National Catholic Reporter way back in the 80s and the 90s, in the face of intense pressure from the church and from others. The media broke these stories, but the media can't break every story. We always have to remember it's victims coming forward and it's up to us to create a, an environment and policies that enable victims to come forward. It wasn't McCarrick, none of this came, came to light until 2018 when a victim who had been a childhood victim of McCarrick's in the 70s came forward to the church. The process worked. What really strikes me, you know, there are rumors about McCarrick, there are rumors about everybody. Uh, you know, you, you tried to chase them down as best as you can, but there were no firsthand witnesses. Nobody would put their name to anything. And what's really striking, even in this report, is almost nobody puts their name to the abuse they suffered as an adult, even today. It's priest one, priest two, priest three, priest four. I never could get even close to anybody who even had firsthand knowledge of anything. So it's really, I think what it really highlights is the importance of victims coming forward and of the church enabling victims to do, uh, to do that. I, I think I have a good question uh, following up on that. Uh, from uh, our observers, our people who are listening in, um, is anyone aware of an organization with a hierarchical authority structure that has created effective structural barriers against enabling its members to abuse without replacing that hierarchical authority structure. Anyone want to respond? Uh, two things are true at the same time. Uh, this is not our burden alone. It's not just uh, our church that has enabled this, the Boy Scouts were in the news for 
just horrific stuff that in some ways dwarfed this. The, the second thing is we have to acknowledge that a lot has changed. Uh, David said uh, a victim of McCarrick came forward. It was submitted to a lay group in New York. Uh, that group said this allegation was credible. Cardinal Dolan sent that to Rome. Rome said, move forward. And in the space of weeks, uh, he was removed. He was no longer a cardinal. And eventually there was a commitment to this report. So children, uh, young people are much safer in the Catholic Church than they were and probably than they are in other organizations. I do think the, the hyperclericalism that is revealed in uh, this report has to be addressed and I assume we will get around to this, but I think two things ought to be acknowledged. Things are different and better and that uh, we're not alone in this problem. Does anyone else have a comment on that? One thing, uh, picking up, yes, I agree with John. Um, it's, uh, it's also, um, I think we have to have a view of what the world looks like, right? Because right now we're looking at the US, uh, we're focusing on the US, where um, it's very different in other countries. Uh, they're not as forthcoming, uh, if anything. Um, uh, victims are absolutely silenced and uh, prosecuted, uh, per persecuted uh, in, in some cases. It, it's terrible. Um, I, I, my, my pain is enormous when, when I see, yes, there was a McCarrick report. There is a, a report with um, very good things that we have been able to understand and with flaws that we need to um, uh, make better. But um, what I um, and I want to go back to to Viganò and his QAnon, um, you know, theories. But but um, I um, and the bishops um, in the U.S. that that supported that immediately went against Pope Francis, and then now nobody speaks, right? Uh, but the use of survivors for their own, um, you know, benefit, right? Uh, these were people. Uh, Viganò was a nuncio here in the midst of all the abuse crisis. I don't believe that he didn't know anything. I don't believe that he was um, that, you know, no. but he said nothing. And, and many others, obviously we know, said nothing. Yet now, uh, because it's convenient to their cause, uh, they use survivors. And that is painful to me. Um, even though we get good things, but um, you hurt so many people on the way. Um, and um, in the center of all this is something that many of you have said and that David has said and all of you, um, it's the corruption, corruption, money in the church. Uh, if you link all these people, they are a minority because there's, I truly believe having been hurt by some, but I truly believe that there are many more good people in the church than bad. But yet the bad ones, if you look at them, um, at, they're a um, loud minority linked to power and money and they bond together. And that's what we have to um, it, it, get rid of because it replicates itself all over the world. It's not just the US. David, do you want to add something? No, I just I think those are, are great points. I do think, um, you know, unfortunately, you see this system replicated in so many other uh, areas of life. Uh, look at the Harvey Weinstein scandal, all of these kinds of things that, that, that have come out. So um, sadly, the, the Catholic Church is not unique. Uh, but I think, you know, and we're focusing here on the Catholic Church in many ways, in many respects, the, the church is, is kind of in the avant-garde of this uh, effort to reform an entire culture and an entire institution. And we should be. This is what the Catholic church should be doing. This is our role in this moment. And, um, you know, so, so there is no real good um, example of how it's been done before. Most every other place that's been struck with scandals like this is had to disband. Look at the Boy Scouts of America. Look at so many others, the Hare Krishnas. Um, 
you know, that, uh, that have gone by the wayside. So there's a, a real responsibility and an opportunity for the Catholic Church to show how it can and should be done. Kathleen, do you wish to comment? Uh, just to affirm uh, particularly what John said and, and, and the way he said it. So he said uh, things are different, things have improved, um, and also that the Catholic Church is not unique or alone in this. Uh, he stated it so compellingly and so beautifully and so accurately. What makes me nervous is when people use those two observations to somehow let the church off the hook. And that happens um, uh, all the time. Well, we fix that problem. Sometimes I, you know, I go to events or I read things that make it seem like this problem disappeared in, in 2002. And we just know that that is not true. I do know there are, are people working very hard to keep children safe uh, in dioceses and uh, my children go to Catholic school and that wouldn't happen if I believed they were unsafe. Um, uh, but I think it's still a, a a very real problem and one that we're not going to know the full scope of until there are many more equivalents of the McCarrick report until many more survivors reach the point where they can come forward either uh, because of their own uh, coming to terms with it or because of their knowledge that they will be heard. I want our audience to know that we have received many questions and we're uh, prioritizing them now or gathering them together right now. So we have received many questions. I think there's one question here though that is a continuation of this topic we've been discussing and perhaps someone uh, on the panel would wish to comment on it. What do we know is the process of choosing a bishop? Who writes recommendations? Is a turna, the, the three names that go to the Pope, made by the nuncio? What role does the congregation of bishops play? Anyone? Well, uh, I don't know uh, how all that happens. Uh, they describe some elements of it. I personally has, have received a questionnaire which asks, about candidates and that gets into it. The, there are three names are suggested. The uh, congregation for bishops, I uh, reflect them. Bishops in the surrounding area, the province make recommendations and then names go to the Pope. In this case, uh, John Paul II said, I'll handle Washington myself. Mm -hmm. And Cardinal O'Connor said, that's a bad idea to send McCarrick uh, and McCarrick heard about that and wrote a impassioned letter denying all this and got it to the Pope secretary. And Pope John Paul II believed McCarrick and appointed him. As someone who believed McCarrick, I'm, uh, I don't know if you should be a saint, but I, lots of people were deceived by uh, McCarrick. Let me give you an alternative on this question of bishops. And it's a month out, so let me be really concrete. Uh, we had a look at what we call them. I work for bishops, I admire bishops. Some of them are really impressive leaders. I've never called anyone your excellency or your eminent. And I don't call the ones I don't know by their first name. Uh, it seems to me we need simple lifestyles, simple liturgy, uh, they ought to put their mitre on and take it off by themselves. Uh, that could be doable. Uh, where they live, what they drive uh, could help us uh, see them as servants rather than rulers. Uh, let me describe, and this is sort of off the wall, an alternative to that process. What if, you know, a di diocese X, uh, there's a vacancy and the nuncio said, uh, we're looking for a new bishop I'll try and make this quick. Uh, we're looking for a new bishop. We want criteria and names. And he submits those to a group from the diocese that's diverse. It has the chancellor, but it also has a DRE. Uh, it has women, it has men, it has Latinos. It has, and they submit a report to the nuncio and say, this is what people want. Here are some of the names that are coming. What if like a lot of places, uh, the nuncio reached out and said, the Holy Father is considering you uh, for Diocese X. 
I would like for you to meet with a group of leaders confidentially to talk about that, what they need, what you bring, strengths and weaknesses. And then they make a report to the Nuncio and said, we met with a number of people and uh, they're wonderful people. Here are their strengths and weaknesses. And that goes to the Pope. That would be so different and it's possible. It would take a lot, but it's possible. Here I have another question on a different topic from Megan Clark. Could you address sexual assault and harassment of adults? And in particular, the abuse of Catholic women religious by clergy and bishops. I am thinking most specifically of the abuse and treatment of sisters who have come forward in India. And still the problem that victim survivors are not believed. It, it's appalling. Um, it's appalling that in this day and age when we're saying, oh yeah, things are better. Um, that's what I meant by uh, look at other uh, countries, look at other, um, look at vulnerable adults, look at sisters, look at, look at women, right? Um, uh, we have done a lot, but it's, it's a small percentage of what needs to be done. Um, for me, um, we're discussing here how, how the bishops behave, how we elect them, how we make them better, how they serve us better. Where are the survivors? The, the, the survivor, um, men, women survivors, uh, have to be the center of our topics. Um, and um, the, the suffering, and I, I know you all know, but the suffering that goes on on people's lives after having been abused in any way. And it, it doesn't matter if you're a child or if you're a vulnerable adult. Abuse is horrible abuse. I've said this before, when bishops, I've been in other panels, I think in one in Georgetown or Notre Dame, um, where a bishop, a very prominent archbishop said, well, you know, the 80s, 90s, we didn't have protocols about, you know, how to treat these things. Excuse me, what are you doing as a bishop if you can't recognize such horrible crime, which has been a crime before Christ, after Christ, Middle Ages now, and it will always be wrong? Where is the voice of the survivor? Where is the caring for the survivors? The situation with that, that this person asks about sisters is prevalent, it's, it's, it's happening now. What are we doing to solve that? Um, I mean, there are so many unanswered questions and we feel that yes, we have a McCarrick report, which is a great step for sure, but the suffering and the horror that is still going on for so many people in our church is real and it's now, and we need to address it immediately. Okay, another question. What does the report mean for those who are implicated in covering up and perpetuating McCarrick's abuse? How are they responding to it and how will they be held accountable? Well, I, I'll take a, a crack at it. I mean, there's not um, so many people are, uh, we're talking about events of the past and so many people, too many people are dead <laughs> or retired. So there isn't a lot of accountability. Juan Carlos mentioned Archbishop Vigano, who was um, the uh, nuncio during uh, the time of many of these events, the, the Vatican ambassador to Washington during the time many of these events transpired. and and transformed himself into the great accuser of Pope Francis. And now he's off in hiding someplace, um, uh, you know, and, and um, sort of operating his own campaigns from some secret undisclosed location. Um, you know, should there be some penalties for him? Um, and again, I would just, you know, I don't want to focus too much on McCarrick. McCarrick is a symbol and an emblem of a bigger problem here. There are lots of other bishops, Bishop Bransfield in, in West Virginia, that scandal of a year ago, money, sex, the whole thing. 
um, Bishop Archbishop Neinstedt, as, as, as John Carr well knows. We could go down the line, and this has been going on for a long time. Cardinal Greer in Vienna back in the 90s. So there are so many examples we could, we could put out there. What has happened to some of those uh, uh, people who either committed crimes or, again, what this whole episode points to is what people are really so angry about, which is not just the, the priests who committed the crime of sexual abuse, but those who covered up for them. How do you account for the rejection of the opinion of Cardinal O'Connor about McCarrick by key figures in, in the Vatican decades ago? This, oh, uh, this gets to uh, inside baseball and uh, 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 Cardinal O'Connor and Cardinal McCarrick didn't like each other very much and uh, shared similar turf. And so there may have been some sense that this was personal, uh, not uh, pastoral. Uh, the uh, uh, David's point about how this band of brothers fights like a dysfunctional family is a useful one. I would like to reinforce uh, two comments and then uh, would love to hear from Kathleen about uh, the question about women and uh, the, the, the scandal. But I actually met with Cardinal Vigano on a range of issues. And at the end of the meeting, uh, uh, I said, I'm from St. Paul, Minneapolis. It's my home diocese. And Archbishop uh, Neinstead can't be Archbishop there that for all sorts of reasons. It's personal conduct, his cover up, all sorts of things. And uh, without pausing a beat, he said, we can't give in to the enemies of the church, the media, the lawyers. And I said, as long as he's there, it's a good day for the media and the lawyers. But he is now the great hero, or tried to make himself the great hero sticking up for, for victims when it looks like uh, he was just trying to weaponize the sexual abuse crisis to go after uh, 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 the Holy Father. And frankly, there is a temptation to make excuses for our friends. I might have been a part of that. But uh, Archbishop Neinstead had a role with the Napa Institute after all this was out there. Uh, candidly, each of them has to atone uh, Cardinal McCarrick, I said, a dear friend, I hope he will come to own this, to apologize for it, to confess it, for, for his good, for the good of his victims, for the good of the church. Each of us, uh, whether we're an archbishop or a member, has to figure out what we need to do to help heal the church. And healing will only come after justice and accountability and transparency and making things right. I could just pick up on that uh, real quickly, um, uh, pick up on that point that John said about Cardinal O'Connor and inside baseball. It is inside baseball to a degree, but unfortunately it has a big lesson, which is that Cardinal uh, O'Connor did not, you know, again, he was rivals with, with McCarrick. So how much of this was personal? How much was he trying to do the right thing for the wrong reasons? You also have to note that uh, Cardinal O'Connor, when he was ill with brain cancer, traveled personally to Rome to lobby Pope John Paul not to appoint Ed Egan to mm. succeed him. And John Paul said no, and he appointed Ed Egan to su succeed him. So there's a lot more going on there. Money talks and all these kinds of things talk. Um, and, and the other point I think that should be brought out relative to what John was saying about uh, Archbishop Vigano and also relative to John Paul II, there was a lot made about John Paul's uh, upbringing in communist Poland, where gossip and rumors and the secret service, intelligence services used these things against the church. He had this circle the wagons mentality. You never aired your dirty laundry, even if it were true. Let's get a, leave aside questions of sanctity, whether he's a saint or, or not. The bigger question here is one of ecclesiology. Are we going to have a, you know, a, a fortress Catholicism that's going to 
hide all of these things and believe that's the best way? Or are we going to open up the windows truly? We have to stop seeing loyalty as staying silent. Loyalty, true loyalty to the church is speaking up. The scandal is staying silent. It's not a scandal to speak out. Kathleen? Thank you. I did want to jump in on the question of uh, on Juan Carlos's question, and uh, but it relates to broader points too. I'm uh, directing a project uh, funded by the president's office at the University of Notre Dame and run through the Kushwa Center uh, called Gender, Sex and Power Toward a History of Clergy Sexual Abuse in the Catholic Church. And uh, there are researchers who are just beginning to ask all of these questions. We have researchers working on uh, clergy abuse of young girls and asking, was that not talked about because it was normalized in some way that was within the realm of normal in a way that abuse of children or uh, abuse of young men was not. We have scholars thinking about abortion in the context of clergy sexual abuse. What evidence is there about uh, priests who were uh, helped procure abortions for uh, many of the people they impregnated? Um, Women's women religious certainly uh, that is a, an untold story, and and also um, the complicity of women religious of some women religious in in this crisis. I mentioned Mother Mary Quentin earlier, and her dismissal, but but she wasn't a hero in this story. Uh, she was mostly raising the concern because she wanted to avoid scandal, and uh, actually later she provided. Uh, a home for uh, Cardinal Law when he resigns from Boston. Uh, he, she offered him a place in one of the Alma Mercy's convents in the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. Uh, so I think uh, we're, we're just beginning. This is, a, as we've all said, a really important step, an important thorough document. But there are so many angles to consider here, and uh, it will be years before we can develop uh, any kind of uh, understanding of how these all these layers fit together and work together. We're very close to the end here. We just have a few more minutes. I have one more question I want to ask, and then I'll invite you all to make any final comment that you might have. One, uh, one viewer uh, asked, I want to focus on the money. How is it possible for a bishop to raise control, and distribute millions of dollars without any oversight. Where does this money come from? How, how common is this practice in the United States? I, I seem to be the expert on a, a failed institution, so I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, the way the church is structured is uh, bishops have a lot of power and they run their dioceses. There are uh, structures supposed to be in place, finance councils and the rest, pastoral councils, but uh, where is the oversight for that? Where is the fraternal correction? What about a bishop uh, who uh, raises a lot of money and spends it on himself? There's no evidence that McCarrick spent the money on himself like Bransfield did. He spent it on, uh, a variety of things, some probably wonderful, but he also made sure everyone knew uh, that he was a good fundraiser and that he was helping the Vatican and others. The, uh, the key thing is to open up this process. The question of who gets made a bishop, who is a pastor, who goes to the seminary, who is ordained, cannot be the work of a narrow club of clerics. I love priests. My, the Eucharist is core, and I don't want to be seen as this, but they don't have all the information, they don't have all the insight, and they frankly don't have a lot of experience. If parents were in the room when these decisions were made, there would have been different decisions. Mm -hmm. If victims were in the room, survivors were in the room, there would have been different decisions. So the, at every level, we need to find a way to open up these processes so that, as I said, who gets named a bishop, who gets ordained, who goes to the seminary uh, is not an isolated process, but an open process whereby other voices are heard. And they need to reflect the diversity of the church. Many of the people who give advice are 
insiders like me or people, frankly, who give a lot of money, which goes back to the original question. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to invite all of the panelists. Uh, if you have a final comment you'd like to make before we end it, uh, please do. I'll, I'll just want to, I just want to note that the report I love the dates of the report. It begins in 1930, and I understand that that's when uh, that the year of McCarrick's birth, and that's why it begins there. But uh, to me, it really underscores that sexual abuse and its cover-up have been woven into the fabric of U.S. Catholicism for much longer than church officials have understood, let alone admitted. And again, we need to take the broadest possible view uh, and treat this as a, a problem that historians should be working on as well, as well as um, it, theologians, journalists, uh, but it really is something that's been so deeply embedded and it's going to take a lot of research and many more McCarrick reports before we understand it. Thank you. Well, I would just echo what uh, Kathleen said and, and, and also John Carr. I mean, it, it gets to bigger issues of what is the church for? Is this, again, oh, McCarrick's lifespan covered a time of the American Catholic emergence into American society as an institution, as a culture. It, and it's been this kind of sense of institutional advancement and preservation. And bishops have been identified so closely with that institution. The big questions I think which John is raising is what's a bishop for? What's a pastor for? What's the church for? When we can answer those questions, we will get the kind of bishops and pastors that we need. There's a lot of policies, changes that need to take place, reforms that need to happen. But in every institution, personnel is policy. And if we get good priests and we get good bishops identifying them and we get popes who will advance and promote those people, then a lot of this problem will take care of itself. Juan Carlos? Um, so I would like to dedicate my la last words here to, to the survivors. Um, without the survivors, this would have never happened. Um, and, um, you know, I said it before, and there's many survivors that never saw justice, um, that died in, in, in agony uh, throughout their lives for having been through what they have been through, uh, men, women who, who, who couldn't, uh, live the happy life they deserved to live because they were violated in the most horrible ways. Uh, there's people right now that are look that are listening to us and um, have probably never spoken and and carry this this pain inside. Um, and I want to tell them that that uh, the world has changed and there's going to be people. Uh, I can assure you, anybody in this panel and many others who will. Uh, lend you a hand, you know, the Catholic Church and, and elsewhere, it's full of, of, of good people that believe you. I, I, I was um, impressed when Cardinal uh, Supic invited me to speak for three days so he could catch everybody to all his clergy so they could listen to a survivor. Um, and they, and and it was, I was so scared <laughs> being in front of so many priests and telling my story and saying what, but that's what you have to do. That, that takes courage sometimes from bishops. And it's weird to say that listening to a survivor uh, should be courage because we're often called survivors, enemies of the church. Well, I'm not an enemy of the church. I'm a proud Catholic. I don't know what I would be without the Lord and his mother in my life. I wouldn't have pulled through what I've done. But uh, the survivors come in many uh, different ways. Some are angry, some are sad, some are pained to know. And, you know, um, we have to listen to them. And all these conversations have to begin and end with the survivors in mind, because they have been the ones that have been, that have suffered all this um, uh, corruption and horrors that so many have, have, have followed. John, you have the last word. Well, I, I don't want the last word, but I want to thank Juan Carlos for his courage and his example. Uh, his example and the example of other survivors had an impact on me. And frankly, uh, you wonder whether anything good comes from these horrible uh, stories. 
the Pennsylvania grand jury and the uh, McCarrick revelations caused me, I was talking to journalists and I kept saying silence is a problem. And then I had to realize my own silence uh, was a big problem. I had never talked about to my family, to others about what happened to me in the seminary. And it wasn't the horrors that Juan Carlos experienced, but it was awful. And uh, the candidly, because Theodore McCarrick was my, is my friend and we have done good together, in some ways, these revelations were a worse betrayal and wounding uh, than what happened to me. But because people have stepped up, uh, we're better and we're getting better and we have to get better still. The last thing I would say is we're more than our failures. We have to get this right. But as David said, what's a bishop for? What's a church for? It's for the gospel. And uh, even in the midst of a pandemic, we're sheltering the homeless, we're feeding the hungry, we're caring for the sick, we're celebrating the sacraments. Pope Francis is pointing us to a culture of encounter and a different sort of world. We have to get this right because the gospel is important and the church is the body of Christ and we have to act like it. Thank you. And finally, I want to thank all those who joined us for this online public dialogue. As a reminder, the recording of today's dialogue will be posted on the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life website and on all of our social media channels for later viewing, as well as on the Fordham Taking Responsibility website. Thanks in a special way to all those who helped us on the technical end of this dialogue. Thanks especially to my colleagues at Fordham, Catherine Osborne and Georgetown, Kim Daniels and Anna Misley. Finally, please join me in thanking our panelists, John Carr, Juan Carlos Cruz, Kathy Sprose Cummings and David Gibson for their outstanding participation in this dialogue. Thank you all.